That's when Jesus showed up, by the way. Except when they were fishing, he kept showing up on the first day of the week when they were gathered together as saints. Today we're going to wrap up chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. And then we're going to take a, just a brief break from the Corinthian study in order to address a discipline issue. I'll be preaching on redemptive, corrective church discipline next Sunday, and then we will take action uh, subsequent, not, that, not next Sunday, but subsequent to that uh, to bring to the next step a process that's been underway for some time. The Constitution and Bylaws says the, our deacon body leads out in that, and they've been doing that. And so we'll be addressing that. Today, though, we want to finish our consideration of 1 Corinthians 13, looking at the, at the letter of 1 Corinthians, overall overarching theme, the perfect gospel for an imperfect church. And if you've been hanging with us uh, for any length of time at all, you know that Corinth had its share, perhaps more than its share, of imperfections. And what we're looking at right now is how they abused the charismata, the spiritual gifts uh, that, that come to each person. When, when you are saved by grace through faith, when the Spirit of God comes and, and gives you the new birth, enabling you to repent of your sin and believe in Christ, He not only gives you Himself, He gives you gifts to use uh, as followers of Christ, to build up the church, to edify, to strengthen the church, uh, the congregation, its mission, its ministry, to advance the gospel. And so we've been looking at this for some time. This is our seventh consideration, in fact, of this matter. 1 Corinthians 13, I want to ask you to stand with me. If you found that in your Bible, if you don't have a Bible with you, we're going to put the text on the screen for you. We think it's critical that you see and hear the Word of God, uh, and, and we read it together every week because we think it's critical that you speak, that you say the Word of God. So if you will follow along as I, as I read 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through uh, 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. We just read together what? the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And I pray that as we wrap this chapter up, we've been in it for a while, that you, some things will happen. That agape love will have taken hold and taken root in your life as a follower of Christ, perhaps like never before. And that you will have discerning eyes to see what's happening around us in the culture where the abuse of spiritual gifts still continues to this day. And that we will be enabled by God's grace to embrace and express the spiritual gifts he's planted in us when he saved us and use it to build up the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, we told you that this passage breaks down in three headings, the necessity of love, verses 1 to 3, the excellence of love, verses 4 to 7, and the per perpetuity of love. Fancy word simply means the, the, it, how it continues. Love continues. It doesn't end. It doesn't stop. 
the, the contrast he's making here, and you'll see the contrast more obviously when we get to chapter 14, is that there are, there are things in the Christian life that remain that actually carry with us into heaven, but there are things that are temporary on this earth that are part and parcel of, uh, of being a Christian uh, that will fall away. For example, we will not evangelize in heaven. Everybody there is going to be, a, be saved. There's no reason to evangelize. We'll, we'll edify, we'll build up, we'll encourage, we'll provoke one another to love and good works. There wouldn't be no evangelism in heaven. But we need to evangelize while we're on earth here. And so when it comes to this perpetuity of love, we looked at verses, uh, began looking at verses 8 to 13 that, that says love never ends. And we talked to you last week about how these different words are used. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. Two different words, and it comes back for knowledge, it will pass away. We told you then that, that the idea of will pass away, it was a, it's, a, it's a passive verb. So uh, will we'll be caused or will we'll be brought to pass away. These things, prophecies, knowledge. Tongues will cease, that they have a, uh, we described to you last week as a terminus point. If you, uh, if you wind something up, it will, it will run down, and when it runs down, when it's, then it will, it will cease. And that's the word used there for tongues, that they will have a ceasing point. Uh, where the difference would come in the discussion is, what, uh, what is that point? Uh, there are two major considerations. One is that it speaks of when the perfect comes, that is, when the, when the end of time comes, at the consummation of the age. There's some that embrace that, and I think it's a legitimate consideration. I think in the context... However, the perfect, the complete, is when Scripture comes into its, its completion. We'll show you that a little more as we get into this a little more today. So last week, uh, we told you that, uh, that I appreciate, I commended to you John MacArthur's commentary on 1 Corinthians. I think he does as, as good a job laying out a case for, for the charismatic gift known as speaking in tongues to have come to a, a cessation, to have ceased, uh, as anybody you'll read except perhaps uh, Walt Chantry in his book, uh, Signs of the Apostles, another great, great read. And then we began looking last week. I told you I'm just going to borrow from, uh, from MacArthur the, the reasons that he gives because I find them very compelling. Um, so we'll move on to that. We talked to you that, that the first... The first reason um, was about what the, what the sign itself meant. Uh, it was a part of a miraculous manifestation to uh, introduce the gospel. Look at Pentecost. At Pentecost, there's 120 are in the upper room. Um, they've, they've been there off and on as they can be there. Jesus has met with them few times. He's, he's ascended back to heaven. Now it's, it's beyond uh, Passover, coming to Pentecost. Remember, just real quickly, uh, historically, Pentecost was the feast of 50. It was the feast of 50 days after Passover. So you had this cycle. And Jesus was with the disciples 40 days after his, after his resurrection. And so you had this cycle of seven, seven weeks, seven seven-day settings. And then on the first day of the week, day 50, is when the disciples were in the upper room and that, that powerful demonstration of a downpour of the Spirit came to them with a, with a physical manifestation attending that. And they came out of that room having, having been up to that point pretty well terrified about the prospect of being arrested and charged with being uh, followers of, of Jesus, the Messiah, that they're emboldened now with the Spirit. And they come out and they're speaking. And I hear, I'm going to be careful. I'm not trying to be funny. But they're not speaking multisyllabic, unintelligible gibberish. They do not come out of the room in Pentecost going, it's just not going on. They're speaking in languages they had not themselves known to the people who were gathered there at Pentecost from all corners of the earth at the time. Or... They're speaking as they would normally speak, and the Holy Spirit does at Pentecost a, a, a temporary UN connection deal. Where if you've ever watched United Nations in session, you've got all these countries there, and the, and the different representatives have their, have their earpieces on, and there's a speaker standing up. He may be speaking English, 
but they're getting it translated to them in their native tongue. We don't know which one was the miracle because the, the hearers on Pentecost said, what's, what's going on here? These fellows are they're, they're from a Jewish background, and we hear, they're speaking, we hear them speaking in our language. We don't know where the miracle took place, but that was Pentecost. And it was, why was it? It was to validate what Jesus had said in Acts 1-8 when they said, Jesus, will you give us an inside track on how things are going to sequence themselves out to the end of the age? That's what they were asking. Will you at this time restore the kingdom? He said, it's not given to you to know the times of the season, which the Father has kept in his own power, but here's what you are given. Here's what you shall do and shall know. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. The word witness in the Greek is martyria. You will be my martyrs. You will bear witness even unto death. And you'll do this in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. So the gospel was planned to go universally. Pentecost, I told you when we were studying that uh, some time ago, is, is the Tower of Babel reversed. In Genesis, when the, when the people that uh, were, were living, they, they began to be too smart for their own good, and they decided, well, we will, we're not going to wait for God to come to us. We will build something up to God. We'll just, that way we can, we can go into the presence of God anytime we want to. We'll build this tower that will ascend to heaven. Well, it was foolish. They couldn't have made it, we know. But the, but the height of arrogance was offensive to God. And he right there on the spot confused them so that while they were speaking about their plans to have access to God their way anytime they wanted, they suddenly couldn't even understand one another. And they're scattered because they don't know what's going on. Now, if you've never been in a situation like that, when I was, when I was in Russia teaching some, time, some years ago, our, our interpreter did not show up for an evening meal when we were meeting in a home with about six or eight uh, Russian uh, Christians. And uh, awkward doesn't even begin to describe it. You find yourself going back on what you learned in charades, <laughs> trying to act out things and you're doing this with someone who has a different language, a different culture that they don't mean the same. It was quite an experience. Right there on the, on the spot, they were confused and they departed from one another. Well, well Pentecost is Babel reversed, briefly. All of a sudden, from, from the known world, these Jews who had come in for, for Passover and stayed all the way through the festival, they can all understand what's being said. And that was the point of tongues, was to, to confirm the gospel and to communicate the gospel. And when you carry that with you, then you can see why people would say, and so when the, when the New Testament came into its complete form so that it was added to the Old Testament and you had what we understand to be the Bible, uh, the need for the, for the miraculous to verify the gospel greatly diminished. Now, I've told you through the years, I'm a, what you would call, if you want to classify me, I'm an almost absolute cessationist when it comes to the remarkable gifts, tongues, interpretation of tongues, um, the healings, those kind of things. Almost absolute. Why, why? Because God is absolutely sovereign <laughs> and he can do what he wants to do and Bill Askell is not going to put him in a box. With the, the, I'm not going to do it. But I can tell you the necessity diminished as the scripture came into being. Where I think it may still exist today, when I leave the door open, is there are places that don't have the scriptures. And God is still communicating, powerfully demonstrating the truth of the gospel when it is shared with people, unreached people groups. And we'll leave that to him. But that's not where we live, though. You can't take that reality in Papua New Guinea and then bring it back here as an excuse to ignore. Let me say one other thing, and we're going to move through this. It's been my observation that people who today cling tenaciously to the remarkable gifts, especially tongues, interpretation of tongues, claims of, of, of having the gift of healing, have a low view of this book. They go hand in hand. We say here every Sunday, this is the inerrant. That means it has, it contains no errors infallible. That means that the nature of the book, because it, God is its author, truth for its content, 
that it's in case because God's told you. And so we say all sufficient. Everything we need for life and godliness is here. This is not going to tell you what kind of car you need to buy, but it's not designed for that. People all over the world are learning how to live a life, a godly life, because of the sufficiency of the Word of God. And so, so with that little bit of reminder to you, We know that tongues also was prophesied in Isaiah. I said this to you last week, just going to touch on it. That there was a passage in Isaiah where, where God said, by a people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to this people. It's a prophecy of Isaiah that, that came true uh, in, in the New Testament era. And then we see, and we, we looked at this last week, that tongues are an inferior means of edification. If, if all the gifts are given to, to build up the church, and if a manifestation of tongues takes place in a congregation where there is no meaningful interpretation given, then there's no edification going on. They're an inferior means of edification, whereas prophecy, and this is what he's going to con contrast and compare in chapter 14 when we get there. Prophecy is a superior means of edification. I can speak to you. You can study in Sunday school. You can study on your own what the Word of God says. And if you're taught by the Spirit so that it, it remains in you, it will shape how you think and how you act and how you speak. It's much superior for edification, for building one another up. Fourth, It was attended the apostolic authority. There are no apostles today. The apostles died out in the first century. And you may have bumped into somebody who's claimed that he's an apostle, and, and we might need to help these people because the word apostle as a word meant sent one, one sent. So in terms of the function, there are still, we send missionaries today. We've had people from this congregation say to us, we believe God is sending us to the nations, and we have, we have commended them to the International Mission Board, and, and they have been formally installed and, and trained and sent. So that function is still there. But the idea of a title, that I'm an apostle, is not. Is not. Well, that ceased again. When the, when the age of the apostles uh, faded. You don't see anybody. If you read church history, you don't see the apostolic fathers, the fellows who were the disciples of the apostles, claiming apostleship to themselves, even though they were taught by the apostles. If there was a successionism, surely they would have gotten in on it. They never appealed to themselves that way. The pastor, the bishop, the different terms they used of their, of their roles. And so when the, when the office office of apostle disappeared. So did the need for tongues. And then one of the points MacArthur makes is that when you study the New Testament chronologically, they're only mentioned in the earlier books. There's no, there's no mention of tongues in the later uh, books of the New Testament. Paul mentions this only in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. James, Peter, John, Jude make no mention of it at all in their writings. And a sixth reason is the church fathers. We talked about that last week. I won't go back over that. But when you read the church fathers and they're talking about this phenomenon, they almost to a man say, and it ceased. It came to an end uh, at, at the end of the New Testament. And so, so we hear from them and we learn from them. Now we know that there have been manifestations. It's recurred. Uh, we told you last week, I believe, that... Uh, that in what's called Montanism, one of the errors uh, of, the, of the early centuries, it was a second century heretic, heretic Montanus, that he manifested this in his, his teaching. Um, and then you've got to go to the 17th or 18th centuries when various uh, Roman Catholic groups began to manifest this in Europe and some of the shakers that were in the New England area. But if, you read, if you've read them, you know all the other things that attended them. I mean, they were, they were called shakers 
not because of the type of furniture they made. <laughs> they were called shakers because they would go into, into shaking fits. If you know your history of revivals, you know in the, in the revival uh, in the 1800s that there were all these bizarre manifestations. People would begin to bark like dogs. I mean, just strange stuff if you read about that attended these kind of things. The devil always counterfeits, always counterfeits the real. He always has. He wants to get people distracted from a true work of God, lifting up Jesus Christ, transforming sinners' lives, and get them onto something else. Jesus said at first, this wicked generation is always looking for a sign. And we've gotten the only sign we're going to get. And that's just as, as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish three days, so will the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the only sign we get. If we need more than that, we're questioning the wisdom of God and we're diminishing the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And so you've had these manifestations. Then, then at the turn of the century, the, uh, the movement that began out in, uh, well, it began in, in the 1800s in England under Irving and then began uh, out in the uh, Azusa Street uh, phenomenon in California that became what we know today as the, as the charismatic movement. Pentecostalism was sort of uh, picked up and carried along by the charismatic movement. In the 60s, particularly, this began to manifest itself. And so there's a, there's a recent phenomenon. Uh, and people, if you listen, and I've studied this, I had some, some doctoral seminars on the charismatic movement, so we studied it pretty intensely in seminary. And uh, they make appeals to Scripture that will not hold up. Folks, it's important to know your Bible. When they tell you that the latter, the, 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 the former rain, the latter rain, talked about in Joel and, and Zechariah, that this is the basis for what they're saying, you can read the text. They have nothing to do with the phenomenon known today as tongues. Okay? And so we love our friends who, who are caught up in this. I think if, if they were better taught, if they, if they had a higher view of this book, and if they, if they were set the place where Jesus is constantly put before them. You know, we sing a hymn, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. And that, can, that includes the phenomenological desire to see the remarkable. The things on earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And so we make much of Jesus Christ. We keep him before us at all time. We preach the gospel to ourselves every day. So that we don't get caught up in one of, the, one of the lures of the devil who wants to get us sidetracked. Get us sidetracked. And so, for these reasons, I believe what Paul is teaching here has occurred. That tongues, and therefore the need to interpret tongues, has almost absolutely ceased from the earth. And it certainly should be considered to have ceased from the church in the West. That is, that is overrun with, with the scriptures in several formats. Some of you have your, your Bibles on your smartphones, on your tablets. Uh, you listen to it on audio. Uh, some of you have some of the, the videos that, that are partial portrayals of various books of the Bible. I mean, it is in so many formats today in the West, that for us to suggest that we still need a phenomenon like tongues is to diminish the full authority, the final authority of the Scripture and the complete majesty of Jesus Christ through whom God has spoken to us in these last times. Now notice what Paul goes on to say. Notice what he compares what is happening in Corinth to his own pilgrimage. Verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. He's saying to the Corinthians here, that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. You're carrying on like children. Now, two things to be considered here. He does not say to them, you're carrying on like pagans, that you have no part or lot in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, he began this letter by writing to the church at Corinth. He embraces the idea that these people at Corinth, with all their, 
all their fussing, their fighting, their bickering, their, their confusion, uh, their, their winking at immorality, and on and on and on as we've gone through this letter. But they are children of God. They are, they are followers of Christ. But they're children. He says, when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. He is calling them to maturity. Another manifestation. As people, as people truly grow in grace, not necessarily chronologically get older, grow in grace, some things happen. As you grow in grace, this book becomes more precious to you. You show me an, an, a, an older person who says they've been a Christian a long time and doesn't have time for this book, they're deceiving themselves. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I'm going to hide its word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We're going to look at that in Psalm 119 on Wednesday nights. We read Psalm 19 this past Wednesday night. More precious than gold and much fine gold, sweeter than a honeycomb, the preciousness of the Scriptures. A maturing believer, just listen to them. What do they talk about? Well, a maturing believer talks a lot about Christ. Someone talking about their experiences all the time. Uh, we have an enemy of our souls who will give you an experience. If that will keep you from fixing your gaze upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And so he's challenging them here. He says, we were all children. When we grow up, when I became a man, I put away childish things. And so he challenges them. Put away this childish approach you have. And he's going to finish his exhortation to them in chapter 14 when we get there to basically say, why would you be interested? 10,000 10, words like this are not as valuable as five words uttered in a way that, that, that ensures that all can understand and hear. 10,000 words that cannot be understood by, by anyone unless it's interpreted better than five words. So he goes on to say in verse 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly. He says, again, what's, he, what's the context here? The assertion in Corinth is that this is the, this manifestation, the way they're, they're treating this, the remarkable gifts, is a measure of maturity. It's a measure of clarity that they have greater revelation and insight on the things than, than the others do. He says, you're looking through a mirror dimly, and the picture here is of a, through a dark mirror. Don't know if you've ever been around some of the older mirrors that lose their, lose their mirror shine on them, and they've begun to turn dark. Have you ever seen something like that? It's hard to pick up your image in that. It is. All the shiny silver look has gone off of it. We see through a mirror dimly, but then, but then, face to face. He said, whose face? Jesus' face. If you, if you hear what he's saying, he's saying, look to Jesus. Learn Jesus. Study Jesus. Love Jesus. Receive the love of Jesus. Tell others about Jesus. Face to face. I shall behold him. He says, now I know in part. Because we're looking into a mirror, a dark mirror, our knowledge is partial. It's a, if you want a loose Bill Askel paraphrase, Paul's saying to the Corinthians, you don't know what you don't know. That's your problem. You think you know more than you know. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. When we come face to face with Jesus in heaven, step into that state of glorification. Full knowledge, ever increasing knowledge, by the way, because we're in a, we're in a place where Jesus is ever increasingly showing us his glory. But full knowledge, not partial. When you discover that you were known, listen, people, some of those haunting words in the New Testament are in Matthew 7. When Jesus says, Many will say to me in that day, 
Lord, in your name I did this. In your name I did this. In your name I did this. And I will say to them, depart. You who lived as if there was no law, I never knew you. Paul says in the Corinthians, now that you know God, rather are known by God. This is really the question of the ages. Does God know you? Would he admit to knowing you? Would he say, come you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world? Or would he say, depart from me into outer darkness? Does he know you? Paul says, even as I have been fully known. He's challenging the Corinthians to think through this. So he closes this section, this chapter. So now, he's already said now we see through a a mirror, a dark mirror, a dim mirror. There's a day coming when we will see fully. He's already said what's happening in in Corinth is childish. Grow up into maturity. So now, here's what abides. By the way, if we embrace these, you know what happens in the expression of the charismata in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? It's a precious demonstration of edifying and building up. So now, faith, that's saving faith, Hope, that confident expectation that the same Jesus who ascended into heaven will in like manner come for all of those for whom he died. That's why he's called the blessed hope. It's not hoping, gee, I hope my team wins this. I hope they come out with this flavor of ice cream. That's a, that's a wishful thinking. This is a confident expectation, this word. And Piper, John Piper says that God will be all for us. He has promised to be for us in and through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That in him, the scripture says, all, in Jesus, all the promises are yes, so be it. So saving faith remains when these remarkable gifts begin to disappear. Saving faith remains. Jesus said, he who perseveres to the end will be saved. Hope remains. The confident expectation that God is true and his promises to you and me are true. And love abide. Love, agape, we've looked at that. We've studied that in this chapter. This unconditional love. You do understand, do you not, that if you're saved by grace through faith here today, you are loved unconditionally by God. And the evidence of that is that he gave Jesus to live the perfect life you were commanded to live. I was commanded to live. And yet we did not. We we have not. We do not. But Jesus did. He became the fit substitute for us. He willingly offered himself up. God poured out his wrath upon him. He should have poured it out on you and me, but he poured it out on Jesus. And Jesus took not only our place as the sinner, even though he'd never sinned, he endured God's divine wrath by his suffering and death, and he satisfied divine justice. So that God, Paul says in Romans 3, can, be, uh, can maintain his justice and justify, declare not guilty all sinners who come to place faith in Jesus Christ. He loves us. He loves us. He says, when you're talking about the gifts, and they were in Corinth, about which one was more important, and obviously in a carnal climate like that, you think the ones that get the more, most attention are the more important, right? 
He said, above all these things, faith, hope, love, abide. He says, but I can distill it one more time. The greatest of these is love. It's love. Do you, are, are you loved by God that way? Do you know that? Have you, have you come term, to terms with that, that he loves me this way? Because you have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil will tell you, you're not loved like that. God doesn't love you. you. You have messed up so many times, he couldn't possibly keep loving you. The world says, hey, you're not that bad. You don't need a God to die for you. You're okay. I'm, I'm okay. You're okay. We're, we're all pretty much okay. Nobody's perfect. And the flesh says, well, I'm better than so-and-so. Three enemies working against you to blind you to the preciousness of the love of God shown to sinners in Jesus Christ. And the gospel is as simple as repenting of your sins and trusting in Christ and resting in him all the days of your life. Reminding yourself, I'm, I'm not who I should be. I'm not who I was. <laughs> but by the grace of God, I am who I am. And in becoming conformed to Jesus more and more. That's what Paul wanted the church at Corinth to know. Because see, when you, when you fall in love with Jesus over and over and over, the, the things on the edge disappear. They're not important. We don't make the peripheral the main thing. When you fall in love over and over and over with Jesus, day in and day out, then the things that become clear in the scriptures to you, and you don't read them with confusion. And that's what Paul wants for Corinth. And he would want it for this church as well. If he were writing to this church, he would say he wouldn't have the same criticism for us he had for Corinth, but he would have the same goals, the same desires to make much of Jesus. And so he's going to deal with them in one more section to drive the nail home on the abuses of the gifts in Corinth. But he would have us today learn from that so that we avoid those abuses and we, we love those people who may be caught up in, in context where those abuses are not only practiced but commended as normative Christianity. And we're in the Mecca of that in this part of the country. So we need to be kind. We need to be clear. We need to be convictional. That Christ is enough. And if you tell me I need Jesus Christ plus anything, then you have diminished Christ. He is enough. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we come to you now in Jesus' name. And Lord, we know that we're all, we're all subject to getting lured away into things that finally are not important and so we help us, Lord, to keep our gaze fixed on Jesus Christ. First of all, help everyone here who names the name of Jesus to be sure that, that we are loved by you. That you know us. And then live in the, in the glorious truth of that. And then those who are not yet followers of Christ... They would not be lured away chasing after these elusive uh, butterflies of religious experience, but, oh, would come face to face with Jesus. Repenting of sin and trusting in him. Saved by grace through faith. While we still have time. But we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand together and sing. Uh, as we prepare to be dismissed this morning, if you're here and the Lord has saved you in recent days and you want to declare that to us, we would love to, to share that with you and rejoice with you in that. If you're here and you want to plant your life in this church, you've decided, you know, I think I need to be a part of a, of a congregation like this, then we would invite you to make that known at this time as well while we sing. Oh, soul, are you weary and
going to dismiss here in a moment. Uh, we want our guests to know we're so grateful you came today. You've blessed us by being here. We want to know if there's any way we can bless you as in return. And then uh, families, if you'll go gather the children out of the nursery, we'll gather back here in a few minutes. Uh, this congregational meeting will not take long. It is a recommendation from the trustees who took, took your input in our informational meeting last week, took some more uh, information we got in terms of of the dealings we've had with Bible Church of Owasso and the